Okay, tell me when you're ready. All right. Welcome to Envision from the United Way of Greater Charlottesville, News Radio 98.9 and 1070 AM WINA. With Price Thomas, I'm Robbie Respetto, coming to you right here from downtown Charlottesville. We want to thank our sponsor, Carter Meyer Automotives, and with that, Price. So we are here on a sort of chilly morning, but I think sandwiched in between like summer yeah, summer, weather. summer weeks, yes. summer days, um, with Eileen Carey, Outreach and Research Program Director of Cultivate Charlottesville. And um, I, I don't want to say more than that because it's more interesting to hear from you. So to uh, to get started, I always joke about this. The one question, the, the only question we've asked in the 32 episodes of mm-hmm. 32, 33, 33 yeah. episodes of doing this is uh, tell us a little bit about you and then we will get into the work and the, uh, the more interesting bits. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Yes. There she is. There go. <laughs> Great oh to be God. here. You'll see that on the on the behind the scenes. <laughs> um, my, as you said, my name is Aline Carey. I am not a Charlottesville native. I was born in Chicago, but my family has lived here since 1994. So I've been around for a little bit. Uh, I went to Western Admiral High School oh, and uh, JMU. I got to get that in there, especially with that <laughs> yeah, big that's win right. this It's been a tough couple days right. for you. Yeah. 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 Go Dukes! <laughs> I love it. You got to get that in. But so I uh, went to JMU and I started teaching high school Spanish. So uh, I was in Northern Virginia for a while and then came back and taught at Monticello High School. Mm. Um, and then I decided I was ready to step out of the classroom. Um, I actually taught with your mom for a little bit. Did you? Yes, Aww. a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. And um, I worked at an education company that was founded by um, the outgoing dean of education um, at UVA. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So I worked there for four years or so and then decided I wanted to get into nonprofit work. I had been on the board of City Schoolyard Garden. I had been through Board Academy at CNE and really felt a passion for kind of in relationships, engagement, the kind of things that are the base for philanthropy. Um, And so that's when I started working at CNE. Excellent. So what attracted you to CNE? I mean, there's so so really 600 nonprofits, right? Like how did you land there as your first nonprofit? Definitely because of Board Academy. Okay. So when I started on the board of City Schoolyard Garden, I think it was 2013, I had left the classroom and someone I knew said, you would love this nonprofit because of what they're doing with students. Yeah. And so it's a way for you to still have that connection to young people. Sure. And I had never been on a board before. Mm-hmm. So I came in and they said, well, almost everyone who's on our board has been to Board Academy. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a no-brainer that I was going to do it. And then I just, I mean, you know, everything, the faculty that they bring in for that program, the, you know, texts, everything that's going on in Board Academy just set me up Mm -hmm. to have a great understanding of the nonprofit world. Definitely what it meant to be on a board, but, you know, just what it means to be in this space. Yeah. So that was my beginning of my love affair with CME was I doing Board Academy. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's excellent. Um, speak to me a little bit about, so you're a teacher. How do you transition to nonprofit? Like what spoke to you about being in the nonprofit sector? What was the passion behind that? I will say that when I worked for Teachstone, when I worked for the education company. Oh, you were Teachstone, got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. we have a, a national presence. Mm-hmm. And so to me, what was missing was that connection with the community. Mm-hmm. And I had a really great connection with the community when I was a teacher. Mm-hmm. I knew students, I knew their parents, and felt like I, I knew people here, and I was working with people here. And so... Um, I missed that. I really yeah. missed that being at Teachstone. Even though I loved the work we were doing, I missed having the impact and having the engagement with people here in Charlottesville as my main, you know, um, goal. Yeah. So that's what really made me say, what what is going on here that I can be a part of and give back to the community and be a part of the community, engage with the community here rather yeah. than that national stage. Got it. So it was about locally connected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got it. What is a uh, back out of this for a second? What is Teachstone? What are they doing? Mm-hmm. Teachstone uh, was started by Bob Pianta, yeah. who's the outgoing sure. dean. Sure, sure, sure. And um, Bridget, 
I just blanked on Bridget's last name. Um, <laughs> so she was a professor. They were both professors and did mm-hmm. this great um, research about relationships, mm. the interactions between teachers and students and how that affects students. So that if you break down your interactions and study how to have the best interactions with students from birth to 12th grade, Mm -hmm. you can have significant impact on the outcomes for those students. And so it was about training teachers to be Mm. able to to do that, to have the professional development that they needed, as well as training observers to go in, see a teacher, say, this is what you're doing really well. This is where you need additional professional development. Mm. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. The, um, I do want to ask you about teaching, um, just being <clears throat> raised by educators and, <laughs> and marrying one and then realizing that whatever it is that teachers have <laughs> passed me way by a long time ago. Um, but but I, I do want to just understand a little bit about sort of how your experience is teaching. I mean, are there are there lessons from that, good or bad, that, you know, you sort of drive into your current work? Because I think a lot of what we talk about teaching is obviously more than just the pedagogical side, right? It's exactly what you're talking about. It's how do you deal with people? How do you deal with people from a variety of circumstances who, you know, and and especially young people bring all that with them all the time. You know, I think sometimes as adults, we are slightly better at sort of leaving some things in boxes. You know, young kids are just, it's, it's out there, right? And so how do you, I guess here's the question is, how do you do that as an individual in a system that's sometimes really not set up for them to really be successful? The education system is, we know it's flawed. We know that we could be doing things better across the board for the majority of students, um, especially students of color. Mm. And I think um, what makes teaching so hard and so intense Mm -hmm. is that you are always working to engage with the students while also trying to get the information to them. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to get the content to them, but the base is the relationship that you have with them and making sure that they know that you care about them, Mm. that you're there, um, you know, having them have that trust in you and respect for you that you then show to them. I was explaining to someone this week, I think what (coughs) exhausted me most about being a teacher Mm -hmm. is the amount of patience you Mm -hmm. have to have with everyone, not just the students, but also their parents, right? Because parents want to know what's going on with your colleagues, (laughs) for sure. You know, parents want to know what's going on, but they're not there. So you're trying to explain that to them with the administrators. So, you have to have this intense amount of patience Mm -hmm. every day and be keyed in to all these different students and people and what's going on and also try to get the content across. So, I mean, that once you've been a teacher, I feel like you can do a lot of Mm -hmm. other things where relationships are the key. So most realtors are ex teachers, actually. I'm always amazed by that. Yeah, yeah, because you, you, you have the patience, you have the relationships. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, when you're talking about realtors, when you're talking about nonprofits, mm-hmm. people want to know that you care mm-hmm. yeah. and that you have respect and you have trust. And right. that is the base of Correct. being a teacher is trying to de- develop that with every single student. That and that's with. tough. Yeah. You know, that takes a lot out of you. Yeah. And so that's why I think teachers burn out, get tired. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of that relationship building to yeah. do it well but agree a lot of giving of yourself to others yeah, yeah. No, i would agree um talk a little bit about cultivate charlottesville so we know that there's food deserts we know that there's issues of health equity we know that not all folks can access healthy food what attracted you to that space and what kind of a difference do you want to make in that space so cultivate charlottesville has three programs that integrate to kind of think about, look at, and change the way we have um, our food system here in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. So Charlottesville is known as a foodie town. You know, Mm -hmm. there's all these great restaurants, there's the wineries, everything is farm to table, Mm -hmm. but we're not a food equity kind Mm -hmm. of place because we have such a high percentage of people who experience food inequity in Charlottesville. We're higher than the state. And these numbers are before pandemic because, you know, the the, pandemic probably exaggerated all of this. Absolutely. But before pandemic, it was 11 percent food insecurity for the state. And then we were at 17 percent. So that's Hmm. that's pretty huge um, for a place that is so known for their food. Right. Well, and as a wealthy community and as a wealthy community resource. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and there are resources. Um, So thinking about the interaction of Mm -hmm. different 
um, issues that make that possible, that mm-hmm. make that food insecurity possible. Mm-hmm. It's like a puzzle of different things that go together to make it the way it is. So you're looking at transportation. You're looking at not just access to food um, on a crisis level, but everyday access mm-hmm. to the wealth that you would need to be able to um, pick choose by your own food yeah. um, it goes to affordable housing it goes to jobs so there's a lot of different things that come together and so for our programs we have city schoolyard garden which is working with the students mm-hmm. in city schools so we have a partnership with charlottesville city schools that we've had since about 2011 um And then we have Urban Agriculture Collective, which Mm. is growing and sharing food in the low income or low wealth and subsidized housing neighborhoods in town. So South First Street, Friendship Court, West Street, um, which is a changing neighborhood Mm -hmm. now, um, Mm -hmm. are some of the locations where we've had gardens for Urban Agriculture Collective. And then there's also Food Justice Network, which is tackling systems and policies that have led to where we are. And of course, you know, Charlottesville has a history when it comes to race that has also exacerbated Mm. the the divide, the issues. Um, When you think about Vinegar Hill and how many just grocery stores were in Vinegar Hill, that is vastly different from... Reed's Market. That's like the only one, unless you go out to like Food Lion, Wigman's out that side of town, right? I mean, it just doesn't, there's not something close by. And even if you can get, let's say you can get to Wegmans on a bus, mm-hmm. how long is it going to take you even to get home with your frozen food, Correct. right? Yeah. So have you wasted money to buy frozen food to then have a 40 minute bus ride to get it home? Correct. So there's so many issues that tie in. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of the pieces that we miss sometimes when we think about it. Yeah. We think if I just make food available at a grocery, sometimes even with the food pantries, we still need to be able to get people there. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that, that need to go together. Transportation to, is being huge, I would agree. Transportation is huge. Transportation yeah. is huge. Community wealth is huge. Mm-hmm. Because everybody wants to be able to buy their own food, to pick and choose, mm-hmm. to provide their family with health things but that's not the that's not the way we're set up we have you know a ton of fast food restaurants close to neighborhoods Everywhere. right mm-hmm. but we don't have the groceries and the fresh markets and there are there are definitely don't get me wrong there are programs working to um you know for the uh, farmers markets working to accept um no. Snap programs. Snap programs and things like that. So it's not as though no one is working on it. (laughs) And when you talk about Food Justice Network, that is made up of different organizations in our area who are in some way uh, working in the food system and coming together and thinking about the different pieces that lead to food insecurity and saying, what can we do to try and get policies and systems changed? So there's other people such as um, local food hub, PB and J, you know, who are also in this with us yeah. to try and make these changes um, and, you know, systematically change the way our food system is set up for Charlottesville. Just, just I need to have a question, but real quick, does Cultivate Charlottesville get produce to Blue Edge Area Food Bank? Like, do, do the food banks access the fresh produce that's local? So there's a couple things that happen with our food. The st- with what the students grow, they eat or cook right there. Okay. It, there's a whole system, you know, with the government, the federal government. So you can't take the uh, fresh produce from the garden and just have it be on the the, um, the lunch line. Yeah, that's not. That. Yeah, not that's happening. not how that goes. Mm. And a lot of people think that that's what we do, but then you also have to remember <laughs> that most of our gardens are elementary school gardens. Yeah, you know, there's the high. yeah, and so those students can't grow enough food <laughs> to also then feed everyone at the school. So sure. sometimes people think, well, aren't you providing all of the fresh produce for lunch? And we do work with the school system. Yeah. We have a, a great grant that we're in the middle of with CAC. CF to work on providing more training for the food and nutrition staff at Charlottesville High School, more resources for them, ovens and different things like mm-hmm. that, um, and making sure that their employees get um, you know equal pay and different things like that. But we can't take from the garden and have mm-hmm. it directly be on the lunch line. So what we grow for Urban Agriculture Collective 
that goes directly to neighbors. So people can access that at no cost all through the growing season. We have one market a week um, and we rotate the location. So if you are in need of food, you can come and pick and choose what you want. A little different during pandemic, of course, we had things already bagged. But that idea of choice, of us not saying this is what you're going to take, but this is what we have. You pick what you want is key to, um, you know, the community and the people who are um, working alongside us, being right. able to, you know, have a voice, have a and voice and guide what we're doing. You know, we have yeah. people on staff who live at Friendship Court or some other neighborhoods in town who, you know, know exactly what it feels like to be food insecure. And so they are driving, um, you know, what we're planting and how we're planting and things like that yeah. as well. Got it. Sorry. When we, uh, I'm just going to give you <laughs> you get no, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was, you I thought was you listening. Had another yeah, I thought, I, had, thought yeah. I had the day off, and it <laughs> always turns out it, that's never the case. <laughs> I keep him on his toes. Like, in chilling here. Out, I call you. Oh, Lord. I know. Good Lord. I, you have a different ringtone now. You don't know that. But I do not know. I always, I always know when it's coming. <laughs> I love it. Um, and I want to make sure we thank our sponsor, Carter Myers Automotive. Um, I want to ask you about... I think education, and, and I mean, a lot of work that we do at the United Way and all, all, also cultivate is this sort of mix between kind of immediate intervention and systems level change, right? Yeah. And you you mentioned something interesting, especially about education, which is saying there's a relational side to it and there's a content side to it. And mm-hmm. I think it, you know, cultivate, there's a we need to eat now side to it and there's a systems change to it. And especially with us, it's like mm-hmm. we need resources now and we also have to build sort of mm-hmm. a system that works for the future. What I'm interested in is, is how you reason your way through that, right? Yeah. And, and I think uh, I have this conversation with my wife all the time who's a teacher and, you know, it's always this battle between, like, does this kid really need to learn history? Or does he really need to learn chemistry? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's not that important. I was reading a study the other day by someone, Angela Duckworth or somebody, that was sort of making the argument that it's actually more important to what she said, race your strengths than train your weaknesses. Right? So if mm-hmm. you have, and at a certain level, right, we're not mm-hmm. just like, we're not going to teach kids math, they'll just let them color, yeah. and they'll all be artists, <laughs> right? But it seems like there's a point where you could make the argument, especially for certain minority kids or certain underserved populations, that, like, look, learning trigonometry or calculus or is might not really be that important because there's so many other things that you know will help sort of further them in other places and so that's sort of off off the beaten path but the question really comes down to like how do you ra- reason your way through kind of like what has to happen today you know and, and especially in your work versus because it's an energy thing right yeah. you're having to tackle the system but there's also stuff that's right in front of you that like you can't miss how do you make that decision Well, as with many people, COVID gave us, Mm. you know, a crash course in Mm. how do you do this right now, knowing that the goal, the long term goal is a a healthy and just food system in Charlottesville for all residents. But in the, you know, immediate of COVID, your point is how do we make sure people have food? Mm. Um, And so we did pivot. Just like, you know, that that must have been the word of the year. You know how sure. the dictionaries pick yeah. the word of the year. Pivot had to be the word yeah. of the year because that's what people were doing. So even though we don't normally get um, granular about providing meals, mm-hmm. we did. So for mm-hmm. students uh, in the Charlottesville City Schools who would normally not have meals during school breaks, like holiday breaks, Labor Day, things like that, we worked with local restaurants to make sure, so we we raised additional funds so we could pay the restaurants, and mm. we worked with um, as many restaurants owned by people of color as we could. So we paid them to make lunch and breakfast meals, and then we were able to pass those out um, to mm. students in different neighborhoods. That is not normally something that we would have been doing, yeah. but it was necessary. And because of Food Justice Network, we had this you know group of people who could help us make that happen. So it made sense that that was what needed to be done in the moment. It's not something that we're still currently doing. We've said to the school, this is the model that we've used. Mm -hmm. So if you all want to continue that, um, you know, in non-crisis time, this is what it would look like to provide meals for holiday breaks. Um, This is how we did it. This is who we worked with. This is how much it costs, all of those kinds of things. So that allows us to kind of turn back a little bit and concentrate on some of the goals when we're talking about working with the city. So a big thing that was going on um, was the Charlottesville Plans Together team as they were working on the new comprehensive plan for the city. Mm -hmm. So the last comprehensive plan was in 2013, which sounds, you know, it sounds like 
forever Forever ago. And so as they were working on this new plan, we were engaging with them. The last plan had the word food in it one time. So in 2013, the plan for the city of Charlottesville only addressed food Mm. once. Hmm. So we said, you have to be looking at food security, at food access, at this food system that we have here and look at different places where you need to focus on food. Mm -hmm. So the new version that was just adopted, I guess, maybe three weeks ago has food security mentioned 65 times. Wow. So it's, you know. Advocacy, right? Yeah. Yes. And working on Mm. um, shifting the needle Mm -hmm. and changing the way people are even looking or thinking about these issues that are affecting a large population of people in Charlottesville. Our neighbors are Mm. affected by food insecurity. And again, you know, you're going to a restaurant that you love. You're maybe not thinking about that, but it is it is a big deal here in Charlottesville. Yeah, I don't think. I don't think a lot of people would would say that they knew that. Mm-hmm. No, and and that's anecdotal, but I don't I don't imagine that that's the case. I mean, seventeen percent is high. that's high. That's high. It's almost one yeah. in five. And then what you're thinking about is you mentioned it earlier. Charlottesville is a very resourced place, sure. right? There because there's a university here, right. you know. And so when you have that kind of neighborhood, when you have that kind of community where there's, um, especially you know, you have like Darden, mm-hmm. you have that in school. So people come out wanting to do things, hmm. but it in some cases it is about really thinking differently and investigating how again the problem can be integrated it's not just the it's not just can we give food to people mm-hmm. it's also how can we change things that have gotten us to this point so how yeah. can we change change the transportation system so as an extension of what happened during covid uh right now charlottesville area transit is free so mm-hmm. for the next three years you mm-hmm. can ride the bus for free certainly didn't used to be it was like twenty dollars a month for the past right, right? Yeah. yeah it is free for yeah. everyone right now but there's still the issue of the routes and making sure that right. people have access, you know, still right. to get to groceries and markets. So there's still work to be done, even mm-hmm. as we are making changes and improving the system here. Do you? I'm gonna I'm gonna steal this and yeah, I'll kick it back to you. You see that? Do you see that <laughs> look? Though? Do you see that? Like that was a look up. I'm yeah. gonna let you do it. But yeah, once, yeah, 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 yeah. once, first come, first one. serve in this booth, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, but I do want to ask about that theory of this puzzle theory because I, I I like it and it's a it's a great metaphor. Is there is there a thing that you can pick out like the one thing that people always miss or that often miss because i think you've mentioned a couple times that look it's more about just getting people food and i think that's that sort of Mm -hmm. immediate intervention versus systems argument is it transportation is it sort of education is it resources from a standpoint of okay we give we can give you food and then what if you can't cook it or store it or you know i mean is there is there a piece or a couple pieces that you guys can identify that are like look if we really start to get this right it can catalyze kind of the next stage and the next stage and the next stage that can lead us into, because I think we've joked yeah. about this, that like sort of the, the point of our work is to not be needed. Right. Yeah. Right. Like if we do this right and we've done it really right, we'll be obsolete. Then we don't have jobs. Right. <laughs> right? Absolutely. That's yeah. totally right. When you think about, um, it, you know, especially again, the way things have gone during COVID just, you know, have put everything on this huge stage. But you would, wouldn't you love that there didn't have to be food banks? I mean, that's not true. There's always going to be crisis, you know. Sure. So whether it's a um, a hurricane or yeah. a pandemic, like there's always going to be those crises. But it would be awesome if we didn't even have to think about that. I think that uh, building community wealth here in Charlottesville is huge. And because of Vinegar Hill Mm -hmm. and the disruption and destruction of the community that was there and the wealth that was there. And when I say wealth, I don't mean, you know, millionaires. I mean, people being able to provide for themselves Mm -hmm. and, again, have that choice and voice in how they lived. Um, So when that area was raised, it just... um, it just demolished what people had built for themselves. And so um, if folks have the ability to pay for their own food, to you know pay for their own transportation, mm. that's what folks want, yeah. to be able to do their own thing, to be yeah. able to pick and choose what, what works best for them. And even with you know food banks, we sometimes forget that 
um, people still want to be able to come pick and choose. And so a lot of places have gone to setting it up more like a grocery yeah. than I, you know, I hand you a bag you and that's it. You go different sections and Yeah, what you and want, you, get, yeah. you get, because that's what people want. They yeah. want the autonomy to be able to do that. And so a huge obstacle is community wealth. Hmm. So that's public and um, private partnership that would change that in a city like ours. Um, So it's the nonprofits working along with the anchor institutions, working along with the banks. It's everyone Hmm. coming together, whether you're talking about, you know, PVCC's programs or you're talking about, you know, what's happened from different um, credit unions. Like it's it's going to take a public private partnership to build that community wealth. Uh, And I think things roll from there at the same time that you know people are working on that you still have to change transportation and some Hmm. of the other issues um education is key to everything i mean every issue that we have and you can you know go back and look at education and educational opportunities Mm -hmm. and um again charlottesville has great schools whether you're talking about the county or the city there are great schools in charlottesville but we're still not getting everything Right. Hmm. And there are definitely changes that can be made uh, there as well. I'm saying that as as an ex-teacher, not necessarily, in, you know, my cultivate role. But yeah. um, just knowing that there are always students who don't get what they need hmm. yeah. is tough because there are a lot of resources here. So, you know, just looking at different ways that we can make sure that we build those relationships. And as you said, Price, you want positively contributing members of society mm. should they know trigonometry probably maybe to some it depends level. it yeah. depends, right? <laughs> depends what they're interested in, yeah, yeah but you want to make sure that they're going to be able to have a positive contribution to our society and also do what they want to do for themselves and their family you want them yeah. to be self-sufficient and so um you know working to make that happen whether you're talking about education or whether you're talking about food access for people is huge Mm -hmm. And I think that whole argument of how we sort of evaluate at least educational success is sort of this whole metric, you know, Mm -hmm. this whole GPA thing and X, Y and Z. Right. And and I think to your point is is it's not always responsive to each kid. Right. I showed up to school with two parents and food and I got to sleep and I had a quiet place to work. I mean, there's all these things. Mm -hmm. And I think it really speaks to your point of all of these issues which are sometimes boiled down to like, well, you're too lazy to do your science project Mm -hmm. is significantly more than that. And Mm -hmm. so similarly, it's like, well. Yeah, I gave you food. What happened? It's well, that's it's much more complex than yes. that. Um, yeah. And so I'll let you. I'm gonna I'll seed the mic for a second, and then we get, <laughs> we got to take this home. Yeah, we have to take it home. I know we're at our time. I just was curious about um, the health equity piece. To what extent Cultivate Charlottesville draws the connection between um, type two diabetes or you know high blood pressure and diet. Like how much of that is a part of the narrative and the work you're doing? So for, when you're talking about the students, when you're talking about uh, different neighbors, we are definitely concentrating on health. Okay. And um, we have, through different partnership, it all depends, like Move to Health, yeah. you know, is a is a um, organization here in town. So we work with them, um, trying to work with the nutrition department at the high school to mm-hmm. look at more fresh local healthy uh, items. Our food Perfect. justice interns did a huge project where they did taste tests. They they suggested some recipes that they'd mm-hmm. like to see on the line and then they did taste tests. The nutrition department made those things mm-hmm. and gave the students a chance to try them out and then put them on the menu this Wonderful. year. Okay. So the idea of, um, again, educating the youth, but then also um, working with neighbors to see it, to say what do you want us to grow that would be healthy that you would want in you know in your homes mm-hmm. um, is a piece of it and then having partnerships with UVA Health with uh, Centara and things like that so we couldn't do this without the partnerships and the collaborations mm-hmm. um, and we you know we have a couple brand new board members who are um, doctors and mm-hmm. surgeons at UVA Perfect. who are looking specifically at pediatric outcomes. Mm-hmm. So we're definitely keyed into the health aspect, especially not only, but especially in this program that we have around healthy school meals um, mm-hmm. in the partnership with with uh, the city schools. That's perfect because it starts so young. Those yes. patterns start so young. Yes. I think that's why I was asking the question. By the time mm-hmm. you're in your 40s and 50s, that's when you're starting to see the impact of not having had healthy choices Absolutely. most of your adult life and childhood, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, that's perfect. That's good news. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that that's happening. Yeah. yeah. 
And I know you said Carter Meyer Automotive yeah. is yeah. your that we got our truck from them. We have oh, our good. our Cultivate truck came from them. So I'll just give a shout out. Yeah. Uh, they helped us out with that. And so, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So the, the last thing I have for you is, is kind of a, if you know we understand some of the players and some of the pieces. We understand there's resources. We understand there are people who are probably well-meaning and interested. So what do they do? How do they either do one of two things, get linked up with you guys or sort of figure out in 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 to the to this world broadly, mm-hmm. right, to this sort of food security space with that they feel like they can contribute. If we have sort of at least slightly walked them off of the uh, it is more than just food thing, because I think there's a lot of that of, mm-hmm. of, you know, I think it's hard to say that and also not make people feel bad if they're doing that, yes. right? Because that is important and we want to make sure no, we say that like that. Absu- <laughs> it's absolutely important because, as I mentioned, there's always going to be crisis and whether it's big like pandemic or it's that a family has lost, you know, a job, there's always a need for crisis. What we want is for when people are being you know, are saying I'm going to access, um, you know, a food resource that it's because it's a crisis, but normally they mm-hmm. have access to what they need. Which but just right. be part of how they're able to live. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Not absolutely. Just a, yeah. But I mean, we do crisis need situations. Yeah, yeah, we need food banks and we need, need food pantries because those things are always going to come up. Part of it is making sure you ask. So if you think that there is a need for more vegetables in a certain neighborhood, you can't just swoop in and say, okay, I've given you the vegetables. Right. Here's some cucumbers. What, yeah. What if someone says, oh, we have all of the vegetables we need. We were hoping that you guys were going to be able to help us with electricity in our neighborhood. Yeah. Mm. So just the idea of when you come up with a great idea, which again, happens a ton in this area because mm. there's so many smart people. There's so many I resource people yeah. who want and have a passion mm. for making change, but you have to ask people and engage First, hmm. to make sure that what you do is going to make that difference and is going just to, to, you know, have a positive impact on the people that you would like for that to happen for. So sometimes people come up with the great idea, they put it into action and then realize that it's not <laughs> quite what somebody needed or sometimes what somebody wanted. So the idea yeah. of making sure you ask first and, um, and and engage with people. You know, we're all neighbors. Mm. So engage with people and find out what they need and then work with them to be able to, you know, change things or offer things. People want to be able to do for themselves. So coming in and saying, I want to work with you to provide what you need mm-hmm. is also a huge way to do it instead of just coming in and saying, here it is, drop yeah. and go kind of a thing. It made me think of the move to health. Um, one of my friends was deeply involved in that work, and she said we'd go into families' homes to cook these vegetables, but they had no pots and pans or any way to prepare anything. Mm-hmm. And the expense of even putting that together was beyond a budget that they could afford. Yeah. So, like, to your point, great to bring all the stuff in, but if you don't have, you know, the very the things way to, to cook use it, yeah. and use it, um, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So. So I think that's uh, that's another big part of it is mm. making sure that you're checking in with folks to find out what they need before you offer the resources. Mm. And so um, you asked how to reach us. We're um, www.cultivatecharlottesville.org. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Um, so people can always reach out to us. I'm Aileen at <laughs> cultivatecharlottesville.org, A L. E-E-N. Um, so people can always reach out. We get lots of um, requests for volunteers. Mm. Again, with COVID, things have been kind of off and on about how large we do our volunteer um, events. But um, yeah. And of course, we always like donations. Yeah, We're in the middle, yeah, middle yeah. of our winter appeal. So um, people can reach out to us in that way as well to support. But also just to learn more about food justice in Charlottesville. Mm. There's a lot of information on our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, so there are ways to just kind of even get your mind around what are the issues around the food system here in Charlottesville and then see how you might be able to plug into that mm. or what you know would be your area. Wonderful. Fantastic. Good. Yeah. No more questions. I mean, you did an amazing job. I, I, no I thought I understood cultivating Charlottesville, but I have a much broader understanding of how um, extensive this network is you've created. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me in here. Yeah, well, thank absolutely. you. And big thanks to Aline Carey, our sponsor, Carter Myers Automotive. If you want to get in touch with us, um, Robbie Mann's The Inbox, make sure you check us out mm-hmm. at United Way Seville or drop us a note in vision at unitedwayseville.org. And if you want to keep up with Cultivate, as Aline said, you can check them out Facebook and Instagram at Cultivate Charlottesville. Check out their site, cultivatecharlottesville.org. And she very boldly presented her email address live on air, Aline at cultivatecharlottesville.org. 
use wisely, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, for Robbie, Price, and Aline, enjoy the warm weather. We'll see you next week.